know this is a an informal type of gathering. I'm going to record that this in case there is some good content that comes out of it. Uh, and then kind of, well, we'll see how it works. Either piece it together or just have the whole thing available um, to refer back to or whatever after the fact. I'm going to go ahead and get started. It looks like we have about 18 people here. Monica, that's completely understandable. And um, I think I might have corresponded with um, her. Is she new? Okay, yeah. I, I did correspond with her about that. And so um, if she wants to go back with the recording, but then if there's a time, because I know we just did the first round or the most recent round of cataloging training just last month. If she needs some um, more training in between, oh, she was, okay, good. Um, then, I'm, then I'm not too, too worried about it, but if she needs anything, you know, she can um, actually, yes, yeah, Sarah, I knew that they were having a stress management webinar, um, but I saw the announcement after these were scheduled, as is, the, the case now apparently because I'm not actually on ILF stuff anymore. So we, we are competing with another um, thing now and I think of maybe a few others in the future as well, but I tried to schedule around and still keep this as a, a regular scheduled thing. Um, so let me, we have a couple more people coming in. So I wanted to first say thank you guys for, first of all, um, kind of being the guinea pigs for this. For There are going to be seven um, of these cataloging circles. The goal of them to be to hopefully facilitate um, and foster a sense of community within Evergreen, Indiana, there are there is a core group of catalogers that tend to communicate a lot, whether it's through the listserv or um, the participating with committee work and those types of things. But we know that because there are almost 130 Evergreen Indiana libraries and within each one of them, at least someone functioning as a copy cataloger, that there are a lot of people that um, are not necessarily um, getting looped into the conversation. And, and my concern has been, and it's been something that came um, out of some of the most recent trainings, um, actually in April, was that there needs to be a way to bring some more people into the conversation. Um, for that sense of community and then also to develop some mentorship relationships. So today is going to be a little bit structured, um, but not structured in the same way that there's going to be this um, training topic. We just have this topic of interest that um, we started, we used to start the conversation. Today, that is going to be preparing for summer reading, and the reason that, that I chose that is be, just because it's a timely thing um, as we are getting ready to do something with whatever this 2020 summer library program season is going to look like. Um, so a couple things about the process for today. Again, this is a little bit of an experiment. Generally, when um, with Zoom, you have the option of a webinar or a meeting, and each of them have limitations on their functionality. Um, when I was first envisioning this, I honestly wasn't sure how much um, interest there would be in it. And 
as the interest form started rolling in and I had already had in my mind that it was going to be a meeting rather than a webinar, um, I had a little bit of a moment of panic and said, how are we going to herd all of these um, people in here where we want to actually have a dialogue in some manner? So I don't really know the answer to that today. We're going to see how it plays out a little bit. Um, but I would encourage you to, if, if you're comfortable having your webcam and your microphone, if you have those available to you, to go ahead and have them, um, to use them until we crash it, which is a possibility, um, just because it's a great thing to be able to put a face with a name so that when at some point in the future we can actually look upon one another's visage in the person, we're not just completely blown overboard by it. Oh, that's who you are or whatever. So one of those ways that we form relationships with one another, not really a cataloging specific thing, but my hope is that you guys are going to be finding new relationships within the Evergreen Indiana cataloging committee. And I just saw Jennifer um, and Vicki's faces pop up, so thanks. <laughs> um, and then there's also the question of how Zoom is gonna function as far as the microphones go. In some cases, I have to turn them on, in some cases not, and I always forget what that case is. So if you want to say something and find that you can't turn it on, that's fine. I see that Debbie just unmuted herself, but I don't hear anything. Uh, Sarah says I, her laptop, laptop has decided I don't have a camera. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And I think I have three cameras around here and I'm not entirely sure which one's doing what. So there's that too. Okay, so I did put together the briefest of agendas. And oh, the other thing is, please have your chat box open um, because I, that's probably going to be other than me because I'm just gonna blather on like this. Um, it is gonna be where you see the most conversation happening there. And so when we get to the discussion and the questions, that's where you're, you'll probably find the most content. I also will um, try to be as seamless as possible at, as we find the need for screen sharing. So we'll see how the whole thing goes. So you need to have your chat box open. Um, you may want to have your participants list open because there are um, some options there we might use as far as using like the yes, no thing. I don't know. It's up to you. You decide how, how it works best for you. And you may just have this running in the background listening in and I totally appreciate that as well. The other thing has to do with LEUs. So this is eligible for LEUs. Um, but it's considered a round table. And so a round table, I think that you can earn up to five LEUs in a certification cycle or 10 LEUs, I don't know, five or 10 in that five year certification cycle for round table. So even if you participate in all seven of these um, cataloging circles, you get the certificate when you go to Sherry Harris in the LDO and um, to recertify at some point, she, she may look and say, oh, you have too many of these, you need to um, have another type or whatever. So I think that it's five. Anyway, so I, the next thing I wanted to do, and you got this in your email, um, and actually I just got another one in here, is the, um, the feedback form. It's basically a way to get, to gather some preliminary 
uh, questions, concerns about what is going, how you are impacted as a cataloger as it comes to um, summer reading. But before we do that, I, I just wanna, I'm gonna test out a little bit of this functionality here with Zoom. So if you have been cataloging with Evergreen Indiana for more than five years, if you could click the yes button in your participants list or wherever it's showing up there, it could be a, a variety. And I'm gonna kinda do some informal so five years or more with Evergreen Indiana cataloging. Okay. I'm gonna give just another hair of a second there to get some responses there. Sarah, I'm not sure what your screen looks like. So you may have a, a bar um, here. I, I'm gonna show you how messy my screen is with this screen share just a second. share. Let me see if it will show you everything that's on here. The thumbs up would probably work. I see I'm not showing a thumbs up on mine anymore. So um, I don't know if you have a participants list. You can see what mine looks like here. Hit that thumbs up and let's see what it does. I'm gonna go with uh, nothing. Oh, there is a thumbs up, it's under the more. Okay, so we do have clapping, we can thumbs up, thumbs down, we can yes, no. Um, there might be this little three dot thing, the little ellipses thing for more options. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and Clear these out. Okay, so we have about 10 people who responded, um, and I'm gonna change that screen share so you don't have to look at my whole mess of everything. Nor all of, every time I like do this whiplash, pop right on that there, here we go. Um, in here, now, how many of you have been cataloging for a year or less? in Evergreen, Indiana. And go ahead and you can hit the, the, um, the yes button or the thumbs up. So a year or less. And, and what I'd like those of you who have been cataloging for five years or more to do is take note of those people who are marking a year or less. And actually, I'm going to change that to two years or less. So if you have been cataloging with Evergreen Indiana for two years or less, go ahead and click that, that yes button or the um, thumbs up. So these are the people who are going to likely run into issues <laughs> We all run into issues. I, I've been like touching the, the catalog for over a decade now. That's, in, that's insane. Um, but, and I still, half, well, half the time, 5% of the time don't know what the heck I'm doing. Maybe that's a little less of an exaggeration. And have to find somebody that just does it more often. But, so we definitely see in here that we have people who have expertise and we have people who are um, either novice or maybe journeyman status and the, the opportunity to um, provide and to, to provide help and to ask for help as well. Okay, so within that, we did get um, some feedback in the feedback form that I'm actually trying to get the link to that amongst all my other things here. Okay. 
I organize things this morning, which is a great time to organize things right before you need to find them. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put this back into the uh, the chat screen. So this is the link to the um, the the preliminary questionnaire that was part of the email that I sent out. And we did get some responses to that. The first question being, um, how does preparing for summer library programs impact cataloging for you? And it really was across the board because, and I think it is reflective of how different our organizations are set up. So that in some cases, we have dedicated tech services department, we have maybe a senior cataloger or two, and then we have copy catalogers. And then in another um, situation, we have somebody that is the children's or teen librarian um, who is also doing collection development, who's also doing cataloging and processing, and, and then also programming and how they're all obviously and necessarily impacted in a really different way. Some of the comments that came back in. Um, and I, I'm going to read some of these ver verbatim and then others I'll probably just uh, summarize. And I do want to change that so I can actually read that one. Yeah. Um, this one was, since I work in a comparatively larger library with a tech services department, cataloging isn't really affected by summer reading. Normally, we just need to be aware of big events to help keep the shelves as stocked with new materials as possible. And so the comment from this individual also um, brings up some things that, that hopefully we'll, we'll talk about soon. Um, and how that may change for this summer, because so many things are different this year in terms of where we are working, how, and then how that impacts the workflows and how that has changed what we're looking at for summer reading. So, um, the going on says this year, I don't think that's going to be a factor since we probably won't have in person events. Uh, how many of you, if, if you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to assume that most of you do, um, how many of you are going to have in person events in your library this summer? And you can just go ahead and um, either, yeah, click yes or um, a thumbs up for that. If you're going to have in-person events, or you can click no if you know that you're not going to. Now I'll just kind of hold off a second as we get some more people to provide feedback on that, whether or not you're going to have in-person events. So it looks to, to be that the majority, and right now I have, um, oh, it, so Vicki has a cool comment here that if you're not following along, that rather than doing a summer library program, that um, they're probably doing a fall library program. That's interesting. I, I'm, I'm curious to see what, what that's gonna be like. Let me see. Don Lito, welcome back. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and clear that. So if you would, in oh, we'll get there in just a second. When public services staff did material selection, did material selection, cataloging tended to slow down in the summer because they did less ordering. Um, but now that we have a collection development library and that's not the case. So this is all this one comment. Um, another comment in here, and then I'm gonna open it up for 
your um, feedback into, into the chat. Uh, it, and this has to do with somebody who is managing multiple roles in their library. So they put simply the, simply the amount of time that I have available for cataloging is very much reduced when I have to focus more on SRP planning and implementation. When a new book order comes in, I try to have a two to three day turnaround for cataloging all the items. In the summer, that time slips to about one to two weeks. It's probably not a big deal to take a little more time, but depending on what is coming in, it might mean a slight backup of materials until I get everything done. It feels like I'm being inefficient and creates a mental stress until I'm caught up. So, for those of you who have to juggle multiple roles, how are you impacted, like, whether it's like this individual or um, in your own way? If you could put your comments into the, the chat box. And I'm just going to, as you are doing that, I'm going to continue talking. Um, and if you want to just say something, you're welcome to unmute your mic and and do that as well. And then I'll I'll shut up. I'll shut up for a second so that if you want to do that, you can. Going back to when I was, of course, now I'm at the State Library. My role has changed very significantly as it comes to um, I don't do cataloging in terms of collection development. I do it in terms of training and those types of things. Or if there happens to be a cataloging party for a library that's coming in or providing support for a library that may have a cataloger that is not available at a time. Excuse me, my nose is itchy. Um, Sarah has a really good question. Uh, and I'll just finish my, my thought on this is that I was also splitting roles where I was doing collection development. And this was specifically when I was dealing with, with teens. It was a little bit when I was also working as a director, but as a teen librarian doing collection development, cataloging, um, and then program development at the same time, so leading up and then trying to prioritize all of those things. How do you prioritize that when they're all priorities? I mean, you have to still have the programs, you still have to have the collection to support that, and then you're the one that, that is also getting those things into the catalog, following the, the procedures guide and all, which was significantly different and, and not quite as robust as it is today. So kudos to everybody that works on that. So Sarah asks a great question and I'd encourage you to um, weigh in. How many here are dedicated tech services staff versus those who both do both cataloging and public facing work? So um, if you are dedicated tech services, if you could click yes. And if you are doing multiple things, if you could click no. And as you're doing that, um, Laura brings up this good point that she does more public facing work than cataloging. And, and the challenge with that is that you're still one of those people that can do the cataloging. So you, so you still need to be up to speed on those things that um, you might have to do, but your attention is so much more often drawn toward the public facing and as I'm looking at the results here, we have six people responding as dedicated um, tech service staff, and then nine people, nine people responding as the split roles. So that's, you can see how easy it would be to have your attention obviously split. You have split roles, you have to then, how do you prioritize that time, and now we have 10 people that have marked that. 
um, having the split rules. So I'm going to I'm going to clear these, and I have a follow up question for that. How many in here do not have a dedicated tech services department, meaning that there's not some some group of people, some person that never has to deal with, well, I say never, never has to be public facing. So click yes if you do not have a dedicated tech services department in your library. Okay. And so then it becomes more of a challenge on how it, it becomes more impactful as far as summer reading goes and summer reading, summer planning. So go ahead and put in here, what are the, the things that worry you on a regular basis about having those, whether you have those split rules or not, and then what might be, um, in your mind for this year that might be different than it would have been uh, in years past in terms of getting those collections ready for the summer. Another comment that, that was provided in the feedback form is as you're putting things into the chat, Ah, uh, yes, Janet, we're going to talk about that in a second for sure. Um, is that there tend to be a, a lead up of like kits and things that um, in preparation for summer reading. Now this may change from year to year, but, but what, are, what are then are the challenges for cataloging kits and some of the options that we have now um, as far as conjoined items and things, which we'll talk about in another um, cataloging circle as we go forward. So Janet and Jennifer agree on this, this thing that we're all facing, um, that has to do with circulation and resource sharing being turned back on for the, um, the libraries and then how we are um, managing, dealing with that circulation as well as we're taking that into summer reading. Uh, Sarah brings up a good point. We're trying to stagger things being returned and oh, that makes perfect sense to me. I know that's not how everybody's handling, but they, they've opened their drop boxes prior to starting the curbside service so that the deluge and the quarantine of materials can happen. Um, Sarah, I do have a question for you. Are there individuals um, being kind of deputized from one department to the other to help like are, are there people from tech services that are now supplementing the um, patron services whether it's your circulation department I'm not sure exactly what it's called but in, in kind of that ramp up to um, adding services back And then Shelly brings up something that I, I did want to talk to. Um, Sarah says, not yet. So far, we don't even have all the CERC staff working. Okay, that's fair to say. Laura, that, that was something that I, I've been thinking about that a lot because I know that 
work at home has really um, differed from organization to organization where some organizations are actively ordering for for what way for for what thing but then there are other libraries where um staff have been on administrative leave i haven't i haven't heard of staff in indiana being furloughed yet but um but on administrative leave and so they're they're not getting the the same orders and then of course this is not just impacting library it's also impacting our jobbers and vendors and what their warehouse staff looks like so um have you thought about laura how how your time or your other um catalogers time is going to have to be um divvied up in order to get those things or are you not too worried about it and shelly i'm going to go back to your comment in just a second because that's something that's also been weighing on my mind a lot while laura is, is coming up with a reply to to my not well articulated question um oh, i'm going to go to shelly's comment about fewer dollars allocated to print versus dollars for e-materials and how that how that is impacting you whoever is gathering this question <laughs> Lori yes that's true um are there things that you as catalogers are doing related to um, e-materials or is that something that's generally being handled through the automatic or the automated processes of loading, uh, unloading those records from either Midwest tape for Hoopla or OverDrive? Um, I mean, I have in my mind that yes, there are, of course, bibliographic records for e-materials, but depending, a lot of those processes are automated. And so um, is that somehow lessening your load? Is it creating a, a sense of um, anxiety that, that somehow, I, I'm, okay, I'm just going to say it. I really am very bad at like saying the gentle thing, a sense of obsolescence or um, something like that. And I don't know. I want your feedback on that, the, um, those things. So Sarah says, we reduced our physical budget about 15%. We're putting that money toward OverDrive, Hoopla, and some other digital resources. And how has that impacted your tech services department, your tech services people? Has it freed up some of their time? Has it added other um, additional concerns in there? And Vicki, I'm gonna come back and talk to you a little bit about the, the Sora in just a second. So Laura is from Morgan County and they are doing construction right now uh, during this time, which I wanna say that the COVID-19 is good timing for anything, but there are, in some cases, it has provided um, some room to do those other things that were probably already on the schedule, but it, it's, it's, um, well, you, you, you've all experienced it. We've just had a paradigm shift one way or the other. And she said that we've just gotten the permission to start ordering as of Tuesday. Okay, that's, well, you definitely have some additional concerns. Um, And I'm reading through these comments if, if you have yours pulled up as well. 
um, I'm going to actually go back here to Shelly. So this is, um, that's been a concern of mine and I, it's not something that we can, of course, come to a consensus right now in terms of, obviously this is an informal meeting, but it's good to have that feedback where the overdrive mark, they're just not as a good quality as, as our standards are. I don't want to say that all of our catalog records are great quality. We've looked at them. We know that they're not all great, but they are way better than, oh, I don't know, Sarah definitely remembers back in 1.4 and um, what that was like. And then as we came in, so the, the status of the catalog is so much higher quality and bringing in records from overdrive or, and, and I haven't, I haven't looked at a Hoopla record. Um, I'm not, I'm not even sure if they're in Hoopla, if it's in there. I know that was something they were working on. Um, them not following that, and I'm going to go back. Yeah, they're not. So, so Shelly, are, are they going back in and actually editing the overdrive records? Which I think is great, by the way. Maybe if, oh, okay. <laughs> you don't want me to refer to you as they? <laughs> yeah, and yes, things are worlds better than they were. Um, professionally better now than much. I do want to to definitely give a um, Shout out to those people who have been working on the records during this weird time. I don't want to call it downtime because Lord knows most people haven't been down a whole lot. And if, if you've been down in one area, all of that energy has been put into something else. So, but during this weird time, um, there has been a lot of just great cataloging work that has been going on. I'm going to scroll up here a little bit more. And I'm gonna I'm gonna read this. So I'm reading these aloud. I know you guys can read, but this helps me process it. So far, we are still either not working or working from home. And that yes, that is based out my window. Thank goodness, they're just driving away. So we aren't doing any cataloging. I feel like reducing the budgets will make it easier to catch up with the backlog of physical materials. Yeah, that's fair to say. Um. That's a good question. I'm going to actually throw that question in to here real quickly in another screen and see what he says. Since he's not actually in here, but to 949 or something. Yeah, I don't remember. The, whatever the field is that has the links with all of the libraries that it leads to, 856. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, 856. Okay, <laughs> where's the 949? I have no idea why that's the first field that <laughs> popped into my head. I never used that field. I was going to so. say, <laughs> man, I'm sure if I saw 945, I stripped that sucker right out. So I would have just totally like, OK. Um, so I have that question over in there and, and yeah. you're right. It would be good to know because it could actually be, um, oh, that makes sense, Sarah, um, <laughs> that it could be either way. It could be a complete overlay or it could just be some nicer match point and you know, whatever. So we'll see what he, what he says he's doing something else 
at the, the same time. So those records, they are not great records, but they are free. So we the overdrive getting, records. Yeah, we are getting what we don't pay for with those. So so if we paid for something else, they would give it. I mean, is there something we could pay more for? I'm Not that I'm saying I want to encourage paying more for anything, but. I think you, I think Overdrive would sell us records. Again, I don't know what those records look like, if they're really any better than okay. um, where we're getting them now. I, I would have my doubts. Okay. That's, I'm not a, that's not a big fan of vendor records. Right. Well, no. <laughs> So his response is when there is a subscription change, then the record is overlaid. So um, another thing that, that I will say to, and this is, <laughs> say this. Bob sees a different um, interface for the catalog than we see. So he generally does not speak in the same language as far as it goes. Um, so he, when we talk about a subscription change, that that maybe um i honestly i don't know what he's talking about is he talking about think, metered books well, I, or yeah that could be it it could be well we don't have a lot of libraries that are joining anymore like pretty much well i guess when we we bring on a new library if they sign up for it then that would be oh that's true if we actually merge but there yeah. haven't been a lot of those recently right. either um and generally when they're coming in they're coming in with nothing but yeah, no, that's true. If, if we run through our licensing fee or whatever on a book and it gets repurchased, then yeah, he might be overlaying that record. So any chance Okay, so it, this, is, this is what he says. Um, he says that when there is a subscription change, then the record is overlaid. And I asked, do you have an estimate about how frequently that happens? It, and he said, whenever someone joins or drops out of the consortium, and that being, uh, of course, the uh, EIDC, if I got those letters in the right order. <laughs> um, so it's not that often. So doing some work on those records, even if at some point it does get lost, is going to be helpful in that intermediary time and if if they're crappy and you need to add access points and that's something that you have the time and desire to do please i mean somebody going in and adding quality to the catalog is never ever a bad thing would it be possible to instead of overlaying just update the 856 You get to listen to me just typing. Woo. I mean, it just, seems like it should be possible. It does. Um, the other thing being, though, that there is a tendency to always opt for the automatic one size fits all thing as it, when it comes to updating the, the databases. So even if it is, it is 100% possible. It is definitely possible. I mean, technologically speaking, evergreen speaking, all those right. things. Yes. Is it but something that the, right. the world to do? That is the question. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, fixing the records is fine. I had to do one um, for our, our large print library and pointed out that the series information, and in, I think it was a Debbie McComber book, was 100% wrong. Um, for one of the overdrive records and it was just bugging her so, right. <laughs> so I went yeah. ahead and fixed it yeah yes. sometimes the records are really bad and I've always just defaulted to not doing anything to them because I'm like well I don't want to waste my time if it's my update is going to disappear in two months but right. if I knew that it could be preserved then I'd be willing to put the time into it and in fact like I was saying where when we go back to the library 
we're probably not going to be full time because we're looking at having, you know, like separate shifts that don't work together so that we can make sure we don't have everybody in the library get sick at once. And right. so if we're working like part time from home and part time in the library, we'll continue to have a lot of time to be doing catalog cleanup. And this would be an area we could focus on. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so this is a thing that 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 I've been thinking about knowing um, that there is a shift, okay, and I'll tell you what I just typed to him and what I got back from him um, in a second, that there is going to be, first, there's going to be two things. There's going to be a shift of money from physical materials to e-materials because that's something that we've just seen come out of all of this. Uh, it, it was a... A, a point of controversy, I guess, before, and then all of a sudden it became this imperative. We have people that cannot come in that we must provide materials to, and this is the mechanism that we, at least one mechanism that we can do that with. So there's that shift. We're also going to see in the next few years that there's going to be a drop in budgets because just, I mean, because of the tax cycles and how that that comes through. So anticipate that there's going to be first this one drop in the physical collection budget, but then there's going to be this broader drop in the revenue to libraries. Now, of course, that's also going to be different for communities depending on your population and all, of it, but it is something that we will see in a generalized way everywhere. So then, how that impacts um, our catalogers and, and where that, that shift can also be. There won't be as many things going in there, but doesn't, that doesn't mean that there isn't a need for people in doing tech services. I mean, just because there are fewer books to put in or fewer things that you touch to go in, there are still going to be records and there still is all this work to be done to bring the catalog up to a standard where people can find the stuff be it physical or digital and so here is um i'm gonna so i'm gonna read this thread here that um that includes both bob and anna so He says, we did some COVID-related ads earlier this year in April. My, my response was, but that didn't affect the entire overdrive collection, right? It was just an ad rather than a full collection overlay. His response was right. Then Anna has added, they do ship updated records that do sometimes, excuse me, sometimes overlay existing records fairly frequently, though. So if someone is missing work, that's probably why. Um, so there is the potential for that, but it is, it's not a given that it is going to um, happen or happen quickly. And so I think that there still is definite value, first of all, in, in, um, in working on those records. And this, of course, is, this is applies to those of us in here with CAT1 permissions. Um, so that there is that, that option. If you are someone who has not done work with MARC records at this point, but you're interested in this topic, first I'd encourage you to talk to your supervisor about this and we will have the recording to go back. Um, and then if you get the go ahead to go through um, the advanced cataloging course and then also there are great resource guides and I'm actually, I'm gonna throw this hopefully into the, uh, the share. I hit the wrong thing. You know, there we go. 
So the cataloging procedures guide, there is also the cataloging training manual. There's a lot of um, great work that has been going on with that recently, but the procedures guide, and this is the important thing, has so much information in here um, about cataloging in the Evergreen Indiana Consortium, but then also the procedures. So, and this is, this is something that I need to get better about when I'm talking about catalogers is referring to copy catalogers and then um, catalogers in proper. In some, some places there is the um, nomenclature of a certified cataloger that would be a, a cat one permission level and then a copy cataloger being cat two. And I'm gonna throw this link over into the, uh, the something, I lost my participants and I lost my chat. There we go. And I, I will say, I'm putting that there, not because I don't think that you've seen it, but I do know that, um, There are several places in Evergreen Indiana documentation for cataloging. There is the old cataloging manual. There is the new web client cataloging manual that is um, still coming fully online. A lot of work has been done on it. So when I say it's still, it's not like I'm saying, oh, well, they're behind schedule or whatever. But then there's also this cataloging procedures guide and the procedures guide, I think, is probably the most useful tool um, as far as documentation goes because it, it addresses a lot of things that have to do with the record um, and, and also gives some indications on um, workflows and just a lot of things that are both specific to Evergreen Indiana, but then um, general good cataloging and copy cataloging procedure anyway. So I would encourage you, if you have not um, taken a look at that recently to do that, you see it was last updated this March. Um, yes, Sarah made the comment about having this guide open re if you're working on a parts project, and that's been one of the big projects going on during um, this, I just call it the weird period. Um, dealing with monographic parts, which are really one of my favorite things, but the preferred parts names and um, how we work on this collaborative project in a way that doesn't mess the system up and makes it, it um, easy for our patrons, for our staff to, to use. Um, there is a comment here from Bob that is actually a database query that I'm not going to share with you and it makes absolutely no sense to me. I just have a love relationship with parts, but I know that other people have a love hate or a hate relationship with parts. And so, which I appreciate, I appreciate that completely. And at some point this summer, we're gonna be talking about conjoined items and I'm working on developing a relationship with conjoined items so that I don't come out and say, I have a hate, hate relationship with them. Um, because at this point I do, I do have a hate, hate relationship with them. Except for I recognize the potential for not having to um, do so much unique cataloging for things like kits, that it does conjoined items have the, the ability to alleviate some of that. Okay, so we have five minutes left and we've gone on and on. Some great things for me, at least, I have um, gained some new understanding on a few things, but are there some questions that are on your mind right now um, and there, there was a question in the feedback. 
and we've an I think we've answered most of them. Yeah, there just a fair amount of uh, anxiety going on with not knowing things. Oh yes, Sora. So tell me, Vicky, what what is this going on with Sora? What does that stand for? And this is a collaboration with your school. It's through Overdrive. It's free. We're already paying for it. We opt in. The school has to buy a small package of ebooks to start. Mm -hmm. They opt in, and all the students in our county will then have access to our Overdrive as well as the schools, even if they don't have a library card. They can use their student ID. It's part of what we're already paying for. So I okay. took it. There it is. Here, let me, I have a little thingy in the clue here. Oh, you can see my screen. You can see everything that's going on. I'm not actually going to worry too much then about me. I'll still put the link over here. Thank goodness I wasn't like, well, never mind. I wasn't doing anything terrible. They do, have, many tabs I break. They do have a trial period that, um, that the libraries and the schools can do before they make the decision on whether or not it's something they really want to want to do. So, okay. I, I'm going to actually spend some time looking at this a little bit more and get educated. Obviously, it's not quite as meaningful for me because I'm not in a public library, but it's a good thing to know. Plus, I'm super interested in it. It sounds like the school does pay toward it. The school has to buy, there are different packages of ebooks. Um, they do have to buy a small collection to get started. But once they've done that, they can then have full access to all of ours as well. That's cool. And that's the EIDC um, consortium, for, um, Overdrive consortium? Yes. Yes. Okay. Overdrive. I mean, I'm sure that it's available for the other consortiums as well, but I'm not. Yes. I'm not. Yeah. Well, and they said it, they will work it out with whatever consortium is involved. They will even help us um, get the school involved. If, there are, if, our, if the school is not real sure, they will give us a representative to help us get the information to the school. So it's really helpful getting started. Okay, that's, that's cool with this project. Every, Sarah, is your library um, using this as well or? No, I just read about this project a couple of weeks ago. It started um, actually last Thursday, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think this is actually something they do annually, but um, it, it basically it's to promote audiobook use amongst teens, but anybody yeah. can use it. So if you download the Sora app, then you can you have access to these um, audiobooks, and they release two every week. You can only download those two audiobooks during that week, but then you get to keep them indefinitely. Yeah, forever. As, as, I guess as long as you keep the app. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And 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 anyone could do this, so you wouldn't have to like be subscribed. You wouldn't have to have a Sora collection. This is something you could say if you're a small library and don't have a budget. You could promote this to your users that this is a free resource they could access. That's cool. So, so the, the collection from the school is kind of a value add. Um, and, and then the, this collaboration between the school and the public library um, is a way to extend that. I know some schools are focusing on an, one age group at a time. So mm -hmm. I know that upper elementary, uh, one school bought a collection simply for upper elementary readers. And then um, I know that there was another school that focused just on the middle school aged kids. So they can, they can get whatever they want. All these kids are taking home Chromebooks. Right. So it opens up a whole world of books for them. 
makes it easier for them to find something they will read because it will be something they they're interested in. But th so this is not something though that adds to um, any Evergreen Indiana collection. It just kind of connects collections, right? Between this. Okay, I'm just yeah, I'm just clarifying in my mind yes. if if those things that the school purchased or licensed would be showing up in the um, our Evergreen Indiana catalog. They just show up in the Sora app. Right. Right. Okay. I understand it. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. It's, cool. It's specific for that community. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, I'm going to have to go through because I don't, I want to, because we're kind of at the time for this as well. Yeah, I'm going to learn more. So hopefully that that is also um, something that that some of you can take away from this as well. I'm going to be sending out an email, a follow up email for this um, that has a couple questions that I have for for you guys, and then the opportunity if you have follow up questions for this, and then also um, the link if you haven't already and you're interested in doing it to um, indicate your interest for upcoming cataloging circles. I know that that it, it really, we had, and I can actually look at it. I'm gonna turn off this share because you don't need to see everything that's going on in my screen. Um, we had, Sixty people have it, have indicated interest in at least one or more of the cataloging circle topics. So, um, and while there are, are several who obviously are here today, the majority of them actually pick up the next um, one, which is the twenty first. So, um, just so you kind of have a, a lay of the land for that. Um, so I'll send out a follow-up email from this cataloging circle. And then if you are signed up or you indicated interest in the next one on the 21st, you'll get an email um, to register for that one a week prior to that date. So next week. Okay. Thank you all for participating. It was good to see the faces I saw and get the feedback from, from all of you. I hope it was valuable.